Hey there, everybody. Uh, Fred Van Lenty here, your guide through the comic book history of comics. And uh, the wait is over. We are now going to start with chapter four of the comic book history of comics. New action fun, uh, which is long enough we're going to split it into two parts. But uh, we've been talking about uh, in previous videos, animation and newspaper comic strips and pulp magazines, and now we're going to see how those things synthesize to create uh, the very first comic books. For over three decades, American children had been throwing out every other section of the newspaper to get their hands on the funnies, but it wasn't until the Depression that the publishing industry finally figured out the best way to cut out the rest of the paper and offer a periodical that was nothing but funnies directly to children. In 1929, George T. Delacorte's Dell Publishing attempted an all-comics title simply called The Funnies, but it was nearly as big as a Sunday color section and looked like an incomplete newspaper sitting alone on the stands. The Funnies' reward for confusing the consumer was a swift demise. Then in 1933, the Eastern Color Printing Company of Waterbury, Connecticut, which produced most of the color Sunday funnies for the big Northeast papers, reprinted some popular comics as broadsides for the Philadelphia Ledger that had been shot down to 7 by 9 inches roughly the size of a tabloid newspaper folded over. Fisher's Mutton Jest, Jeff had been selling well in collected comic strip books since 1911 at Strip Dimensions. The, book were, the books were 18 inches wide. And Eastern was curious to see if an anthology of multiple strip reprints might appeal in a more manageable size closer to the ledger broadsides. Eastern salesman Maxwell C. Charlie Gaines convinced Procter & Gamble to use the experimental comic book Funnies on Parade as a mail-in giveaway. Its 10,000 copy print run was exhausted in a matter of weeks. Intrigued, Gain slapped 10 cent stickers on a couple dozen individual copies of Eastern's second giveaway, Famous Funnies, a carnival of comics, and dropped them off at various newsstands around New York one Friday. They sold out by the following Monday. And to give you guys an idea of what the um, some of these proto comics look alike, uh, this is a photo from, uh, or a, yeah, it's a photo from Wikipedia showing the funnies, which was the 1929 version. Notice this crease down the center of it. That's where it could have been folded over in half like a regular newspaper. And you're going to have to imagine this is much bigger uh, than our regular comics. In fact, it was the size of basically a newspaper when you unfolded it. Here is a very rare copy of one of the Mutton Jeffrey prints. Uh, this one is actually, I believe, from 1909. Uh, that date from in, in the comic history comics may be slightly off, but as you can see, the printers decided just to keep regular strip dimensions and do one a page. And uh, here we have Famous Funnies, also from Wikipedia. This uh, is uh, is the is the considered to be the original newsstand comic book, and uh, it is not. Uh, inconsequential that the first people to appear, the first characters to appear on the cover of a real comic book are Mutton Jeff themselves, who pioneered the form, you know, a few decades before. Smelling sales, Eastern teamed with Delacorte's Dell to produce a regular fum famous funny series beginning in 1934. Uh, as we just noted, Fisher's Mutton Jeff would grace the cover, making them the first ever comic book headliners. Mutton Jeff's reprint rights, along with the rights to all the other popular comics in the country, were of course still held in the hands of the all-powerful syndicates. After Dell and Eastern went their separate ways, Dell began Popular Comics, a series featuring mostly strips owned by the Chicago Tribune syndicate, like uh, Dick Tracy, The Gumps, Little Orphan Annie, etc. Dell, Eastern, and others quickly tied up the comic book rights to all the established strips. But one man had the courage to stand against the mighty syndicates, a cavalry officer who braved the fire of Pancho Van Villa's banditos in Mexico, a man who had been court-martialed for denouncing nepotism in the U.S. military, who later survived an assassination attempt for exposing the same. That man was Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, pulp author, lover, publisher, witness to the Treaty of Versailles, and perpetually broke. Nicholson founded National Allied Publishing to ape famous funny success and save his fortunes. But Nicholson made up for what he lacked in cash flow with chutzpah. Who needs established strips? I'll buy new original properties for my comic books. Come on, men, who's with me? Charge! Well, at first, pretty much nobody was with him. Nicholson titles like New Fun and New Comics 
showcased crude imitations of newspaper strips that were poorly drawn and poorly written, and the creators were paid pretty poorly, too. Two of Nicholson's more promising freelancers were Cleveland's own Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Discovering in the nascent world of original comic book stories a less competitive field than that of the pulps, the writer-artist team began cranking out adventure strips like Henry Duval, famed soldier of fortune, for Nicholson. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like, here is a Henry Duval strip. Those of you who are familiar with early Superman can see the obvious uh, Siegel and Schuster trademarks here. Sh Siegel at this uh, early juncture, still Jerome Siegel. He hasn't gone yet with the chummier Jerry, but we'll see that changes pretty quick. Nevertheless, uh, the boys' loyalty to their new medium only went so far. The real opinion of Nicholson's product is demonstrated best by the fact that they avoided selling what they thought, felt was their best property to the major. The inspiration for it, Siegel would later say, came to him in the middle of the night. Perhaps the revelation was as simple as that he could achieve Fleischer-style cartoon violence in a more realistic setting, with a protagonist who, like Wiley's Gladiator, gained Popeye-esque super physiognomy not through spinach, but science fiction. Perhaps a displaced alien, like Edgar Riceboro's other pulp hit, John Carter of Mars. Siegel cleverly merged this formulation with another trope. Introduced by Anglo-Hungarian author Baroness Orsi in her 1903 play The Scarlet Pimpernel. The mysterious titular figure rescues aristocrats from the French Revolution's guillotine, spiriting them to safety across the English Channel with the help of his network of secret agents, collectively known as the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel. His nom de guerre comes from his symbol, an innocuous wildflower. He leaves in notes taunting the revolutionary authorities. None but his League knows that the Pimpernel is really British aristocrat Sir P Percy Blakeney, who adopts a foppish, frivolous persona to throw Parisian pursuers off his scent. We seek him here, we seek him there, We those Frenchies seek him everywhere. Is he in heaven? Is he in hell? That dim, delusive Pimpernel! The seminal instance of a secret identity in literature spawned numerous imitators. Notably, pulp writer Johnston McCulley, who, upon moving to the Los Angeles area, became fascinated by Spanish adobe ruins near his home. They're saying that Cesaro has paid a visit here. Can you not tell me? But I pray you make not the tale too bloody. I cannot see why men must be violent. His 1919 novella, The Curse of, the Curse of Capistrano, originally serialized like Tar Tarzan in Munzi's All Story, introduces the Blakeney-esque Don Diego Vega, a Spanish nobleman in 1810s California that appears to be a cowardly dandy. But Macaulay put an American spin on Pimpernel's class allegiances. Vega's alter ego, Zorro, Fox in Spanish, is a savior of the people for the evil schemes of the corrupt colonial establishment. Silent movie star Douglas Fairbanks saw Capistrano as the perfect vehicle for his signature acrobatic daring do. Co-writing the adaptation himself, Fairbanks starred in the 1920 box office smash The Mark of Zorro. It was Fairbanks who introduced such visual elements as, to the Zorro mythos as his distinctive costume and the initial he carves as his calling card. Now, it is widely forgotten how important Fairbanks was to the movies of his day. Um, here is some bits and pieces from the trailer of Mark of Zorro. He did his own stunt, so in many ways he's sort of the Jackie Chan of his day. Look at him jump over that table there. And, uh, you know, this is the first time you saw a masked guy fighting, you know, in, uh, in real life action in such a way that almost, uh, harkened back to the Popeye-style super violence of the cartoons. And so he was hugely, and obviously this predates Popeye as well, so obviously he was, uh, hugely influential. The ladies loved him. The villains feared him. He was the complete package, people. So, pulp writers swiftly cannibalized the work of Orsi, McCulley, and Fairbanks wholesale, adopting their historical heroes for modern times. Crime-fighting pulp avengers like The Shadow ripped off the Pimpernel's network of agents and rich guy persona, as well as Zorro's outfit and Fairbanks' athleticism. Who knows that sissy swords cannot stand up to twin blazing 45s? The Shadow knows. Jerry Siegel was a Shadow fan. He had a very personal reason to sympathize with the violent hero's merciless war and crime. His own father, a haberdasher, had been gunned down in a robbery while Siegel was still in school. The killer was never found. Wiley's physically perfect man, Zorro's single-letter symbol and populist class consciousness, 
a skin-tight jumpsuit like the heroes on the cover of Gern's back science fiction Pulp's War, the shadows contempt for criminals, a love interest like Orsi's Lady Blakeney, who despises the hero's cowardly secret identity, Fleischer Studios' superhuman combat. All these elements inform Siegel and Schuster's Superman, which they initially conceived of as a newspaper adventure strip. They produced a few weeks' worth of samples to mail to every syndicate in New York. Siegel would later claim it took he and Joe six years to sell soups, piling up a mountain of rejection slips along the way. But the great thing about art is that you can pile up no after no after no because all you need is the one yes. Siegel and Schuster's yes came from the McClure Syndicate, which had been founded by none other than Maxwell C. Gaines to package comic books. Geez, this is really out there, but National wants strips for their new action comics, and they'll buy anything. Ironically, Siegel and Schuster wound up at the one company they had been trying to avoid. The good news, however, was that Nicholson was so in debt to Independent News, his distributor, that he had lost control of his company. Cartoonist Bob Kane, another Fleischer veteran, found this out the hard way when he showed up to collect the $300 the Major owed him. The bad news was that the new owners of Jet National, Independent News' Harry Donfeld and Jack Leibowitz, were not thrilled to hear that their editor had agreed to a published Superman in comic book form. What is this garbage? A man throwing a car around like a toy? It will be laughing stocks. I never want to see the Superman on the cover of Action Comics again. And most of you are familiar with the iconic cover of Action Comics number one. But here's the interior. And you can sort of see here how it is very much structured like a Sunday strip. Um, and you can sort of see sort of the weird panel sizes, particularly places like here where Siegel excuse me, Schuster cut up the uh, the panels to fit the comic book format as opposed to the comic strip format. Even though Action Comics number one promptly sold out, The Man of Steel did not return to the cover until number seven. By that time, Action was selling more than double the average comic book title. National finally figured out that kids weren't going to the newsstand action for com asking for Action Comics. They were demanding Superman, Superman, Superman! So this is an exceptionally long chapter, friends. So we're going to pause here and we'll bring it up uh, once again next week. We'll have the second half of New Action Fun about the birth of the superheroes who, who are not named Superman. So until then, uh, if you want to learn more, you can check out the comic book history of comics from this retailer. And I'm Fred Van Lenti, and I will see you next time.